affirmative action in the Supreme Court. And what, what it may set off is, of course, what's it, is a question that was asked. I don't think we can know uh, what, what it can set off. Uh, but I hope, uh, but, but remember, it is the Supreme Court. And whatever it sets off, that's the law of the land. Uh, uh, I'm not sure we need anything except some of the affirmative action that should have been, been going on. It may not have happened. Uh, so I don't know what it means that the court has taken this case. I can tell you this, that when they took the last case, the court said that uh, at least the, the, the member who was the swing vote, uh, Sergeant Jay O'Connor, said, you know, after about 25 years, I think that maybe we would have gotten to the point where we didn't need affirmative action anymore. What we should be really concerned about is Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, because if the Supreme Court decides that we no longer need to bring, uh, to go to have Georgia and other uh, of the old Confederate states uh, go before the Justice Department uh, before they change their laws uh, that involve just, uh, voting, then of course we really will be in very deep trouble. Are there? Okay, let's go around, maybe, over here, yeah, oh, right there, and then we'll, uh, we'll take three more over here. Put the microphone close to your mouth. Oh, okay, then we'll go to the back, got you. We got you. Um, I want to thank you. I'm 54 coming here. And I can't do the civil rights speech on the Dr. King, um, Robert Kennedy, and all the days. And you're right. If you're right, we're going to get something we got to get live, put out to people. That's the only way the people don't show up. And um, I learned that from working with Ms. Morton, who I love so much. We did work in the office. That's the only way the people gonna get the get the message. If you put out flies and people come to the rally, especially so. Okay. Let's take let's take a couple more. And then there's a lady back here with more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well sure. we'll take maybe two more rounds. So we'll take this round, then one last round. Okay. So, so Thank you. you. Well it's certainly swell to see my old civil rights colleagues. Back in the day, back in the 60s, when we were in Mississippi, when we were in Atlanta, and various parts of the South. One thing that stands out to me today is something you said, John, that has to do with when you were chastised, so to speak, and you said your retort was, well, we can't be against Dr. King for this, but you were sort of asked to uh, step back while you were still in the South. The, it's a question, as I see it, uh, of strength. Um, the kind of strength that that you as, as the Otto Murphy of the Civil Rights Movement always demonstrated. That, uh, as you were introduced as being brave, but you were much more than just brave. You, you exhibited kind of leadership that the, that the unsung uh, civil rights people totally admired. Uh, you were beaten, you were bloody, and you would always come back. Uh, it, was, it was incredible, it was phenomenal, the kind of spirit that you showed. Julian, on the other hand, had a different style than yours. Julian, was, was an erudite person who had, had a totally different background from you. But my question is, is there a way that we can, can uh, sort of coin the spirit that, that you exhibited, John, for today's youth so that they can understand just how how tough it was for us to get the dogs turned on us, get tear gassed, to, and all of those experiences that John, you experienced more than any of the rest of us. I'd like for you to speak to that. All right. Maybe uh, if we could take, 
it's going to be really hard to take everybody here. So we'll do one, two, three. How's that? These three people. And, and then we'll do the last round up there. So let's do three more here, and, the, and, the, and then the last round up here. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Gary. Uh, I'm a child of the uh, Jim Crow area and the Civil Rights Movement. I was born in the 50s. And my grandmother always told me, she died at 104. She said, you will never see a black president. As so long as you live, you'll never see a black president. Uh, I remember her telling me, telling me that. And uh, when President Barack Obama ran for uh, president, uh, I was so excited. And uh, because I remember, she said, you will never see that, a, a black person of color being president. But my question is, when he first ran for office, the old civil rights leaders back Hillary Clinton, they didn't back Barack Obama. And I was wondering why did the civil rights leaders of the 60s was more in tune with Hillary than President Obama. And you was the first one, Mr. Lewis, to step out and to support Barack Obama. Put your hand that for me. All right, two more, and then we'll take it to the stage. If we, if we can keep the comments a little brief, please, so we allow our friends to speak. Okay. Um, I owe you an apology, first of all. The um, national theme for Black History Month is Black Women in African American Culture and History. And so, um, uh, as, uh, Congressman Norton, I think I called your office about a dozen times and I said, we need to get some black women up here on the stage. But I have to, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. Um, just seeing you, it just did something. But most importantly, seeing the young people behind you, the continuity, um, it will continue. It just struck a chord in my soul. So I owe you an apology, and I just, I love the way the two of you just, you know, communicate. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Norton. And my question is, the homeless, African-American population, in D.C. and in the nation, we're the majority. We're never on the panels. Everyone speaks for us. Everyone feeds us. Everyone clothes us. Everyone houses us. And I have to thank this man right here who has opened the door for me personally to do some things as well as other homeless people. But um, even he doesn't get the support from homeless service providers to support the works of homeless people. And tonight, I'm losing my bed because I'm here because federal legislation, the one first and only, still in place, Stuart B. McKinney, um, uh, Bruce K. Bento Act, okay, that was introduced, and the architect was giving credit, um, Mar uh, Maria Pascarini, and she's never been black, never been homeless, and never consulted us to put it in place. I would never be crazy enough to create a law to lock myself out of bed because I'm there after curfew, okay? We need help and support to get on these panels so that we can speak. I am intelligent. They tell me I'm a genius, whatever that is. But I know everybody in the homeless community, no matter how bad they smell or look, are super brains, okay? But our voices are not heard. Dr. King said, and I love the I Have a Dream speech part, where he says, I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners. And I say, will they be able to sit down to a table of brotherhood and include the voices of homeless People, and I want to give you a copy of my homeless magazine. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is directed to uh, Congressman, Congressman Lewis, and that is I know that you had a very close relationship with uh, Dr. King, and I wanted to know what bit of wisdom that Dr. King shared with you that you applied to your daily life. Thank you. Can we take those? Can we take those? Um, can you coin the spirit? The microphone. Microphone. Uh, but we have a microphone for you. You can give her the microphone back. We, we have a microphone. Okay. Can we coin the spirit? Um, the old civil rights leaders back. No, I'm not sure I agree with that at all. Um, and seeing uh, homeless people, how can they be heard instead of simply served? 
Uh, about that you know, repentant thing, I don't think that's true. I didn't think it was true when it was being said. I don't think it's true now that all civil rights leaders supported Hillary Clinton and did not support Barack Obama. Uh, there are people who supported both of them, but to say all were with one, I mean, that's just not true. And you have to prove it to me. Give me a list of the people who supported her and supported him, and I'll tell you if you're true. I, I don't think that's true. I think it's a made up thing. Um, in terms of um, um, recalling the spirit of um, John's John's spirit, you have to understand that you know, and, you know, you don't have people who have that kind of courage and, uh, come forward very often. And it doesn't seem to me that that's what it is we have to have. What we have to have are, are people who are willing to be much more participatory when it comes to movements like. Uh, the women we don't want to just describe. So that the homeless, in fact, have somebody uh, besides themselves who will speak up for them and who will join with them. But the, the issues are different. The one thing I hope we don't carry away from uh, this evening is that John and Julian and I are trying to recreate ourselves. We have failed if we're asking you to do the same things we did. The page has been turned. The issues are different. The issues are new, and they have to be confronted with the wisdom, yes, wisdom of a new generation. Yes. Can I just add, Elvin? Um, I think you're so right. It's a, it's a different world. We live in a different world. We didn't have the new technology. They haven't heard of the internet. Think of well, Stein. You didn't have a cell telephone. Junior said they had a memory machine. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have a fax machine. But we used what we had. We used our bodies as non-violent tools and weapons. We didn't go around with our pants hanging down and roll our butts. We just didn't do that. We walked with dignity and with pride. Uh, we were taught. We inspired. We wanted to reach a goal. Now we would sit there and some people said, no, I can do that. People would beat on us, spit on us, put light cigarette in our hair, down our backs. We went to jail, beaten, left by the unconscious. But we wanted, we were not struggling against people. Custom, tradition. Dr. King would say we wanted to redeem the soul of America. We didn't hate anybody. We wanted to change. Let me give you one example. And some of you may think this is crazy. A white gentleman beat me and my white seatmate in Rock Hill, South Carolina on May 9th, 1961. Rock Hill is about 35 miles from Charlotte, North Carolina. The moment we walked through the door, this guy and several others jumped on us. And a police officer came up and said, if you want to press charges, we said, no. We come with love and peace and love God. 48 years later, this one of the same gentlemen came to my office and said, Mr. Lewis, I beat you. I'm sorry. I apologize. You start crying. His father, you know, son came with him to be encouraging his father to do it. His son started crying. He hugged me. I hugged him back. And this man, the call was spoken to me, has seen me four different times since then. John Patterson, who was the governor of Alabama in May of 1961, he's 93 years old now. He was the one who told his aides to tell President Kennedy. And if he called to tell him he was out in the Gulf fishing and he couldn't be reached. But today, John Patterson is a different human being. He had saved a little bus station in Montgomery and now uh, it's the Freedom Ride Museum. And he apologized for what he did. 